Hey yo, LAZ, after this episode, make sure you go check my bros over there at InSource TV and watch that Super Trife Low Life's interview part two with Face Low, you heard? Leave a comment, tell him Z-Man Suicide Polo with the Ski Man sent you. Jamie Alexander here with Gen Pop TV, and this is the best performing video of the month. Hey yo, LAZ, make sure you check out the story of Kool-Aid all four installments you heard we working hey yo shout out to the god shabu you heard cypress projects if you from east new york out there make sure you get in them comments you heard let me know what block what street what have what projects you out there repping this the story of the 18 part two we dropping heavy, heavy Brooklyn history on this, you heard? Get your notepad, take notes. And if you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and make sure you hit that bell so you get a notification every time I drop some new fire and you won't be caught lacking. You heard? Z-Man Suicide Polo with the ski man running around the hood like he man at 3 a.m. with three swams looking for a dude that ran off for three grams. Get at me. Oh, we are the Lords. Buccaneer Lords. Gonna turn the sex boys out. Bum, 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 bum. Gonna turn the sex boys out. Bum, 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 bum. I is know. that the same lords they was trying to depict in the education of Sonny Carson, or that's a different lord? No. The lords that they was depicting in the education of Sonny Carson is the Jolly Stompers. That was the lords in, in the education of Sonny Carson. Oh, and they just changed their name? Yeah. My brother, and I got to give him credit for this right here when it comes to acronyms, with my brother Born King. The acronym that we got for crime is... Conditions requiring independent means of economics. Mm. Yeah, conditions requiring independent means of economics. The more you oppress people economically, the more that out of that oppression is going to come some other form of economics. the 18 and we ain't even really start getting into the whole you know 18 story yet but did y'all dudes have a rocket launcher <laughs> oh, you know what I'm gonna keep it real with you uh Les. I'm, I'm you know what for me to just out and out say that that shit is some cap shit I could be wrong, okay? And the only reason why I'm saying that is, you know, like a lot of shit, you know, I kind of step away and, and I might have been like on a, you know, a kind of different level when it comes to the younger niggas. So I can't say that they didn't have it. All I can say is that our era, we we ain't have no fucking uh, rocket launcher. But you know, as, as time went on, I'm not going to say what niggas might have had and didn't have, because, you know, if I'm not physically there, then, you know, I wasn't in the mix to know whether they had that or not. But one thing that I will always say, and I got a lot to do with that part, you know what I'm saying? We always had massive artillery. Yeah, because, we you know, the folklore said that dudes had artillery like the real A-Team. Like, I yeah. mean, like the TV show A-Team. Yeah. I think I I, I, I might have lost the, um, well, that first when I was sending Tyreek some of the pictures so you could set the shit up, I had sent them uh, a picture from the newspaper where they had, um, they had rolled in on us and found all type of shit, Tommy guns and all type of shit like that. But yeah, we used to pride ourselves on that. And I, I'm kind of the foundation to that shit because I, when I came down to go to college down 
down and rally and shit between 80 and 84. You know, guns was a nothing down there. So, you know, I was, I was selling weed in college too. So I, that's how I got to know all the rally killers, you know, motherfuckers that, uh, they used to be fucking with them hits, you know, uh, you know, like, uh, they call them shit cap, like P funk, dope and, uh, coke mixed together. So a lot of them dudes used to go and rob houses and shit. And, you know, they come on campus and shit. And I sold the weed, so they'd come to me and, I buy them the biscuit off them for little or nothing, you know, and they go do their thing. So I would get as many guns as I could get. And then when I come home for break, you know what I'm saying? I hit the young guards off. But see, back then, it was it was a stipulation, lads. A very serious stipulation. You can't get guns from me and the guns end up at 85% of his hands. You can't do it. You know? Mm. That was a rule. So I read for all the rest of them that was underneath me. You know what I'm saying? That, you know, that was one of the things right there. <laughs> and I've been in college and all that shit, but you know, I'm already with the with the program from where I come out of come from so automatically I could shit out getting fucking uh, 22 fucking magnums 25 dollars 32 might give me two bags three bags of weed and 15 dollars shit like that you know and then later on I ain't gonna go all the way into that shit but later on you know I eventually ended up getting into that shit full blast going down the VA and all that but that would be another part Oh um, shit! When it comes to the <laughs> to the gun running side, you know. But uh, yeah, that's how that shit started. So we always prided ourselves, you know, on 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 on, on the gun thing, you know, and not just based upon you know, oh, we got more guns than everybody else, even though you know that's what it end up, you know, basically being, but just. Motherfuckers was just, you know, lovers of them, them, them fucking hammers. So that's how that shit, that's, that's what fucked me up right there, you know. And it's just so much shit, but I guess I had to give it up being we talking to that. Um, I came home in my junior year, 1983. Now, remember, I'm telling you this weed shit, so that's how I'm making it through college and shit. I was getting a social security check from my pops passing away, but, you know, I'm always doing my thing. So I came up, I got two pounds of weed and shit. I'm upstairs and everything, and I hear my man L and them is home from doing, you know, day bids and shit, going up north and the early 70s and shit, you know, they the first crew, with, you know, with that Comstock Gladiator School and, and all that uh, shit. Um, so them dudes is coming home now. So I will go and impress them and everything. We in the hallway kicking all this black power shit and different shit. But I got a 25 automatic on me in my back pocket. Like, last, what the fuck? You know? In my junior year, I got this shit on lock, on smash, everything. And I come home and fall right into my environment and feel like I got to put a 25 automatic in my pocket. And that was another thing, the same motherfuckers I'm talking to, we was taught from day one, never pull a gun out, not unless you're going to use it. Never let nobody know you got a gun until the situation arrives. And the reason my OG taught, taught us like that is because you know how niggas is. Niggas get hot when they know you got that ratchet. So now we out and some shit you normally wouldn't have started or did, you going to do now because you know I got this hammer on me. You know? Mm-hmm. And then you might never know. You know how grimy it can be there and you know if you've been out there in the streets just as well as me as niggas... That be your man's and them that'll set you the fuck up. So this is, you know, these are the strict codes that I was taught 
when it comes to the street and everything. So I'm playing by the rules. I ain't even let these niggas know. I got this 25 on me. So now back then, you're talking about 83. It was still, you know, the projects back then, when we was young growing up, we knew all the cops. And that's what's ironic about this shit right here. Because the one motherfucker that bust me, his government name is John. But, you know, he was fat. So we used to always call him Porgy the cop. Him and his man Jack. Jack was a black motherfucker. And, you know, he was fucking all the fine chicks in the projects and shit like that. Jack the cop and Porgy the cop. So back then they used to, you know, we loitering in the hallway. They come in the hallway, y'all, man. Y'all know y'all got to get out the hallway if I catch y'all when I come back. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to give you a ticket. So, you know, the, the usual bullshit. So I figure it's still on that type of time. But he got some rookie nigga with him this time. And what I'm going to say, lads... I think it was more about who I was in the hallway with, my OGs, you know what I'm saying? Like like I said, move, that move, you know? And I ain't gonna go too much into that because that's some police shit, but put it this way, you know, they had, they had real vendettas on them type of individuals, so I think that that might have been a lot to do with, and the reason why I'm saying that it's so much shit, lads, because all of this is leading up to the A-team because prior to the A-team on my side, and that's when we will go into more of the uh, sex boys and crazy homicide shit that we formed. Like, when you did it, I was going into the script about the Brother Wise about bringing up the Imperial Buccaneer Lords, and that's what ministering all of them was. They brought that from bed style with them out there. And once again, they was like that to fight against the white gangs that was out there. So later on, these same individuals, because Minister, Baba, all of them, they ran together. So instead of us being imperial lords, and I ain't even going to say us because I was just a little tad younger, even though me and Box, but Box might be a, a year or so older than me too. So Box was like one of the only ones that really uh, our, our age group, group or whatever that became more official Buccaneer Law. So that's when they started the Buccaneer Law. And they used to have a song right that went to Polydeck Funk, um, Funkadelic shit. Oh, we are the Lords Buccaneer Lord gonna turn the sex boys out. Bum, 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 bum. Gonna turn the sex boys out. Bum, 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 bum. Oh, we are the Lords Buccaneer Lord. That shit right there, right? So, I Is know. that the same Lords they was trying to depict in the education of Sonny Carson, or that's a different Lord? No. The Lord that they was depicting in the education of Sonny Carson is the Jolly Stompers. That oh. was the Lords in, in the education of Sonny Carson. Oh, and they just changed their name? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. They, they, I was, that, that's what was kind of funny with the movie, because they more or less let... Uh, um, all barking them, you know, keep they shit. You know, they had hawks on the jacket, which was short for tomahawks. But the, the Lords was really the Jolly Stomp. Mm. Rainbow, all the niggas that was leaders in that. I ain't really know uh, Sonny Carson like that, but, you know, Rainbow, a few other cats that was classified as leaders or that. I know them, and, and once again, them, all the guards that, that, that's a part of that whole area, Albany Projects and Lincoln Terrace and all that, that whole Crown Heights thing on that side, all of them, you know, became five percenters. So that's how uh, that worked. But um, yeah, it was the Buccaneer Lords, and then also, I'm trying to timeline this shit right. I gotta say, the Black Messiahs had to be before the Buccaneer Lords. 
But the black messiah is, that's another thing. See, that's what I'm saying. A lot of shit was political. So, you know, they the first real, you know, spring of, of everything else that came. And the reason why they formed the black messiahs is because they got tired of fucking police killing us. You know? So it was a flip script. And you got to understand, back then, uh, my first encounter, like, that's why when Bream and all the niggas go through, like, the history, all of us is, like, affected the same way. The first one, and that was out in uh, Queens, where they killed the 10-year-old kid named uh, Clifford Glover walking on Jamaica Avenue with his father. He was like 10 years old. That was the first one. When well, he got hit by then, a spray? No, the, the police killed him. Walking with his father, you, you you probably could go back and research it. Clifford Glover, he was like one of the first, like, you know, I of course, we could never go back to the first. They've been killing us forever. But I'm saying out of my era group, that was the first... Time. What they said they killed him for though That's what I'm trying to say It's like no reason Some old shit, shiny object Some shit that's been so long You know what I'm saying I, You know, I forgot what was The bill of particularities of the excuse That the police used For killing him with his father But that shit kind of You know, that was something that Went throughout New York City back then You know, so we all you know, growing up, always identified with them killing Clifford Glover at 10 years old with his pop. So right after that, the one that affected me the most and, and got a lot to do with my mentality as far as with police and everything, and you'll hear Tut say the same thing in an interview, was when our man Randolph Evans, a.k.a. Divine, got killed in 1976. We had just got to high school and everything. And, and fucking Randy, he was like, you know, him and Shifty, you know how cats that you know in your hood, that if them niggas would have lived, they would have been somebody, whether it was legal or illegal, they just was them type of dudes, you know? Where they, you know, it's kind of sad, but they might have just been dudes that had to leave before they time, but that's that's how live these dudes were, you know, but in, in retrospect of how they was. But Rand, Randolph was one of them dudes, you know what I'm saying? He was in the back. The, there's only two buildings in Cyprus that face the outside street, and I think that's 525 and 555. Those last two buildings that sit right there on Linden Boulevard and Fountain, so uh, it was Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving Eve, you know, with him and my other man, Frederick, I think might have been with him. It was going into the night or whatever, and they was in the hallway, and the police claimed that, you know, Randy had some shiny object in his hand, which never came to be the truth. And they, you know, they knocked his wig off, right? So... When they knock his wig off, that's why I'm saying it's a big difference. Last, yo, we went bananas out there. We rolled all motherfucking 75 precinct, Martin cocktails, all that shit went down, son, for real. And it went down to the point that that family that I say that's a part of my OG history another one of them from that family. You know what I'm saying? Got caught up in that shit and they gave him five years for the riot. Him and another dude. I don't I don't really recall who the other dude was, you know, but yeah, he got five years for that for for us riding on the um seventy fifth precinct. And then turned around what was that shit? I got to look it up because I didn't even do the articles on that again. And that's why I'm glad that, you know, me and you was doing this first because I'm giving you shit, but it's just so much shit that, you know, I don't even mind. We will make this shit interesting. But um, they turned around and they killed Chamel. It might have been like 
maybe around 82, 83, somewhere in that bracket. But anyway, when they killed Chanel, they was afraid that the same thing was gonna take place all over again with the riot shit. So they said, your man from Manhattan, Charles Rangel, and this other lady that was a well-known assemblywoman, a councilwoman from out that way. She used to live up on Plaza and a couple of niggas hit her daughter and all that shit. Anyway, her name was Priscilla Wood. Wood. So they sent them two politician-ass individuals over there. Matter of fact, it was after that because I was out of college, right? So this shit might have been... Uh, like around the end of 84, going into 85, some shit like that. Cause I know I was out of Cali because they came and they came to, uh, it was 335. It used to be a laundry mat in there, but they was using it as some type of tenant patrol uh, home base. So they came there, they got us all together. Motherfuckers had like about a thousand candles and they sent them there so that what happened in 1976 wouldn't happen again. And they used it me like as a ploy to, uh, you know, get everybody not to do anything, you know, physical. So we had a non-violent march with the candles, all that shit. They promised me all type of jobs and this, that, and the third. And, you know, once again, you can't trust politicians. Because I made sure that, you know, we walked up there. It was a peaceful visual. Everybody broke up. The last I called all the Charles Rangel. Anytime I, all I ever got to was their secretaries. Left my name 15, 20 times. Pardon me. And they never, they never got back in touch with me. So, you know, a lot of those things, I guess, was a build up toward me that when, you know, the drug shit really hit, which is where I guess we could go when, you know, we go through the full thing. Yeah, so, you know, they did the political shit on me. I never got through to them and everything. So all those things was kind of a build up and a make up, you know, a leading to, you know, the whole drug shit and everything else, you know. And before we get into all of that fully, that's, you know, all these things is an accumulation of leading us into what we eventually became. And the reason why I say that is when um, my brother, and I got to give him credit for this right here when it comes to acronyms, my brother Born King. The acronym that we got for crime is conditions requiring independent means of economics. Mm. Yeah, conditions requiring independent means of economics. The more you oppress people economically, the more that out of that oppression is going to come some other form of economics. You know? And that's basically what happened with the involvement of the game because prior to that you got to understand when it came to the Hebron situation that was controlled by the Italians and of course Nikki and them got with them and once they got it with they crew so you had to you know know somebody be connected or whatever and plus that was a just a tag. It was my time, but it was going out. Like, we was the ones that was taught against using heroin and all that shit in school by that time. It was going, but the heroin game was controlled on a different level. The crack shit, the coke shit, it ended up getting out of control because once the Dominicans and the Colombians and all the rest of these motherfuckers found out that they could deal with us directly, then that 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 changed the whole the whole dynamics of it. So what I'ma say as to it that that became the first real source or means of income that they couldn't control once it got started. 
you know, so it changed the game from, you know what I'm saying, the high Oakley being older, old timers, and they had to bring you in, and this, that, and the third, to boom, this shit is on and popping, oh, it's, it's a bandit building down the block, don't hold me up in there, put a hole, this nigga can't get out, rock, you know what I'm saying, so, that's the first time ever that niggas, and especially Brooklyn niggas, because you know, it's an order with this shit. The Harlem niggas, the reason they like, they is, is because, and that's another thing, that the first one that brought me into the game, I met this kid, this cat in college, uh, and he was from Harlem. And I don't want to go too far, because all that's going to be a part of our other shit when we continue. But, um, the Harlem cats, they always had older niggas to, to bring them up. Our OGs, all they taught us was the tape. They had to make it Brooklyn take it, you know, let the record wait for real. So we was never exposed to the drug game from the hustling side. So we took the same mentality that we had from, you know, robbing and all this other shit into the drug game. So this is our different mentality from niggas uptown that was brought into the game. And when they was brought into the game, they was brought into the game like, look, there's enough money for all of us out here. When Brooklyn niggas was brought into the game, yo, punk ass nigga, that nigga ain't getting no dope over here. This is our shit, you know? So that was the first time that in Brooklyn, you know, that we was exposed to getting money outside of a nigga thinking about robbing a bank, sticking some shit up, or this, that, and the third. So the drug game, even for Brooklyn, it changed the whole mentality of it. That's how that shit right there was basically going down. So once, you know, we got started, and I, and I remember, hey, see, that's another thing, lads. Niggas don't even know they talk all that Washington Heights uptown shit. Don't you know that a lot of the coke was out there in East New York first? Yeah. All that New Lot shit, Georgia Avenue, matter of fact, from Ashford all. Niggas had it. I seen that documentary, man, with the with the police dude you was talking about. And and they said that at that time East New York was a straight open drug market. Police was on the payroll to protect to protect the spots. Niggas said it was lines two blocks long. You understand what I'm saying? And the police just drive by and secure that shit. And niggas just keep getting their money. Niggas said niggas was getting millions out there. Yo, lads, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Like even, you know, that's what I'm saying. I let the younger niggas, you know, move on that tip. But I went around the corner in, in uh, on Logan Street between Belmont and Sutton. And that's a whole nother story within itself. I'ma just touch it a little bit. And the spot is called Shasta Tunes. And I first started in there with um, this Jamaican nigga named Pop selling weed. And somehow he passed it on to another Jamaican nigga named George. But George started getting high. George is one of the first ones to turn the neighborhood out with the chicks and all that getting high. And my man, Uli, I'm going to call him Uli for right now. Uh, him and George started fucking with each other. And George, you know, was getting so much shit on credit until him and my man, Uli, became partners and that's when we flipped it that was like 85 that was like thanksgiving or 85 you know and that's a story within itself because we had one of the longest runs out there when it comes to the fucking crack game so this shit was originally a candy store and all that well pop we had both sides they ended up pop ended up selling the biggest side and they at first you know when niggas was getting money everybody was buying video stores that's how niggas was washing you know laundering their drug money when that crack thing hit and everybody started getting money and things got crazy was it ever somebody that wasn't from cyprus that tried to come in cyprus and get money 
or was Yo. that or was that impossible? Shit, that shit was virtually impossible. You know, the, and, and see, um, even with Black Oak, you know, because those niggas is like, you know, they like two, three generations underneath me. You know what I'm saying? That's why I said, like, when he talking about Pig and all of them, them Drak and all of them, is, them my little niggas. You know, Drak went out, you know, with me, him, my man Rick and all of us, you know, but back then, that's once again, with, you know, me having knowledge. I was, you know, I would never take niggas out. You know, it ain't no justification to it, but you couldn't rob nobody black with it. So all them niggas when I, when we go out to do our thing, is always, you know, against the, the divine evil. So we get in the whip and, you know, uh, 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 go out to uh, Queens, you know, Forest Hills, uh, Greasley Point, all all that different shit like that. Drak, Drak was in the car with us. That, that I got it up there too when we went through that shit over the one speaker uh, JVC uh, radio that we got some niggas for down by Betsy A. Pooh. But, um, you know, I think it was before we got the radio. I was like, man, we got to get this little nigga out the car, drop him off back at the projects. But, but you know, all them dudes is my, my little dudes and shit like that growing up. And there's so many niggas in Cyprus. You you know, P now, everything like that. That's why most of the people, you know, they are uh, more or less put Glaze, Jesus, you know, Tut and all of them. But you, you got a million other niggas too. You know, they just the ones that more or less made the papers and the, 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 the glorifying of, of, of that shit like that. But we all grew up grew up basically the same and shit. So. But you said nobody never came out there trying to get no bread from, I'm talking about from other parts of East New York. No, hell no. Hell no, it was hard. That's what I'm saying. Little bees and all that. When, when Kasim was talking and he said, bees and I'm in the milk jar. And see, that's another thing, you know, and I ain't bragging about the shit neither, but it's just real shit, lads. You know what I'm saying? I've always somehow was able to get to the plugs. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of them dudes, but you know, Benny and all them, um, Biz and them, they had the milk jug, you know? But I remember when, you know, niggas first got started and came to me getting halves and all that shit for 550. The next thing you know, they blew their shit up. And see, that was the crazy part with me, lads. You know what I'm saying? Because I was a five percent and I was out there from day one. I never had no problems with going at none of those projects. Even at the height of the beefs and all that shit like that. You know what I'm saying? I never had those issues. And, 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 and one I would like to probably say more so because I always really carry this five percent thing like on some real you know upright shit so even when shit was critical and you know a lot of that shit i really didn't want it to go down because you know people all of us know each other forever and that was a thing that i had a real problem with because at one time i was trying to get everybody together because i had the type of connection with everybody but it seemed like you know i was trying to get do together the, the the little ones born and them over and pink out and everything because that was really the initial shit because if everybody could have came together and that's my biggest thing about this whole crack shit and everything else lad everybody talk about all the damages but in war there's always collateral damage you know, the fucking virus came through and killed millions and millions of motherfuckers. So it's always going to be some casualties of war. My thing is, is that what was fucked up with all of us from back then is just like niggas, Negroes always is. Our, our um, demise is that we can never unify. You know, so just think, lads. If I would have got all them cats together that was out there in all three projects and side block and everything to stop beefing. And we do like Nikki did. That's what made 
Nicky and them so crazy. He found the connect, and then all the rest of the cats, jazz, all, all the rest of those niggas that was who they was in their areas. He said, yo, come get down with me. You know what I'm saying? If you buying two bricks or whatever for this price, I got the plug. So now that that hundred thousand, but back then dope was expensive. Dope was like a hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a brick. That's what made dope dope. But you know, you could cut that shit like eight times. I never got into the Hebron game, but that's another thing. My my uncle making me watch him shoot dope when I was seven years old and all that shit. But um that's how that shit was going down too, which was another thing why everybody just couldn't jump in the the dope game, because even if you was a nigga buying an ounce, an ounce was like five thousand dollars back then for the Hebron day. Hey, yo, LAZ, if you pushing a good vehicle, make sure you pull up on my bros in Brooklyn in East New York, 225 Montauk, you heard? Brooklyn Splash. This is a father and son black owned business car wash that's popping in BK. Make sure you pull up, tell them LAZ, Z Man Suicide Polo with the Ski Man sent you, you heard? The truth is speaking. It's Gen Pop Lads, certified cash. They don't know though. Lazatola. Hey yo, LAZ, make sure you check that store link in the descriptions and in the comment section. Now I mean it cop up one of them gem pop tees, hoodies, or accessories. Yer. Jamie Alexander here with Gen Pop TV, and this is the best performing video of the month. Hey yo, LAZ, make sure you check out the story of Kool-Aid all four installments. You heard we working. 